The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Father Andrew Kinstetter. Hi, Father Andrew. Hello. And Pat Scott. Hi, Pat. Hello. Uh, before we get into today's topics, I do want to kind of cross-promote something here on the show, a, a new show on the network that Father Andrew is uh-huh. hosting for us. Uh, the Secrets of Star Wars. Now, if you're, you're a longtime SQPN listener, you know that the name of that show. That's been a part of SQPN before, but we've revived it. It's like it's like the the Force Awakens. You know, the, when Snoke says, "There's a movement. Can you feel it?" Well, that's what it is. It's the uh, Force. It's the Secrets of Star Wars coming back. The, the Secrets of Star Wars Awakens. Uh, so, Father Andrew is hosting that with a all star panel of of. Uh, Young, I always because I want to point out they're young and passionate about Star Wars, uh, and they're Catholic, and it's going to be a great podcast that starts. Uh, we've started the first episode uh, that is out this week. If you go to sqpn dot com slash Star Wars, and then every week after this uh, there'll be a new episode. And at first, it's going to be about the new uh, Disney Plus series, The Mandalorian, which is awesome. And then uh, we'll then I'll cover whatever comes next because there's there's plenty there. So. Uh, Father Andrew, this uh, I'm so excited that you've uh, agreed to take this on. Oh, absolutely. I'm super excited, too. And I just hope it doesn't turn into one of those things where um, I seem to recall Finn and Han Solo talking about the Force and, like, us <laughs> young guys are, like, trying to talk about it. And, you and, know, Dom's like, well, that's not how the Force works. Yeah, that's not how the <laughs> podcasts work. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for giving us the reins to to oh, yeah. you will. <laughs> uh, make mistakes and have fun with this. Yes, it will be great. It's already been a lot of fun. Uh, all right. So let's get into today's topics. Uh, what this? I saw this a while ago. It's a little bit out of time, this topic, but it's actually it, it's timeless because, uh, well, let's just say the the, to- the primary topic is setting up a new Mac for college students that was the original story i saw and i'll have the link to this infographic about you know how to how to help a college student set up their brand new macbook but the idea is really as techies we often are asked by people to help them set up their new computer what what are the basics what are the sorts of things that everyone should do so i wanted to kind of go through that and go through some of the suggestions of this infographic and what sorts of things should we help people to do when they're setting up a new Mac. Now, we're, we're going to talk primarily about Macs today. Uh, we will come back to this topic at another time and talk about, hopefully talk about uh, Windows and even Chromebooks, like the best ways to set those up. But today we're talking about Macs. Uh, the MacBook is still one of the, the most popular laptops out there, and they're extremely popular among college students. And uh, so uh, let's, we, we'll, we'll start here. Uh, so the first bit of advice that they give is to create separate admin and standard user accounts. The admin account gets the, it has the ability to do a lot of things which which could end up uh, breaking things in the in the operating system uh but you all, but you need to have one. So the the what they say is set up an admin account. That's the first one that gets created when you start up the computer. Then immediately set up a second account with more limited abilities, more limited administrative abilities. You still have full access to the computer. And uh, let the let that be the one that they use every day. What do you think of this advice? Is this still valid advice? Do you think? My kind of take on it is is I don't think it's quite necessary. I I think maybe you know a decade ago, it was easier to accidentally hit the wrong key and do something that would you know disrupt the file system or do something bad to the operating system. Right. And you know I sort of tell people I, you have to try really hard to break something on on these new computers <laughs> especially in catalina now yeah and and i guess for me personally as long as you're even just slightly tech savvy you're you're not going to 
you're going to be resistant to do something that you think would break it anyway. Right. And to have to go through the hassle of logging into the admin account to install new software just sort of seems tedious and, and not worth it to me. I, I, you know, I would tell my parents just if you have a question, ask me. But in general, you're not going to you're not going to accidentally hit the wrong key and do something horrible. Okay. okay. I agree because uh, most of the time when I see this set up, the people end up using the admin account for everything because it's so complicated trying to install software or troubleshoot something. And they're always having to go look up the other password. So they just use the admin account anyway. And with a Mac, as long as you have a password on your computer, then it, every time you want to install something, it's going to ask for that admin password. So malware is not going to be able to accidentally install like it does on a PC, because on a PC, all you have to do is hit enter. You don't have to enter a password. Yeah, right. And uh, so there's a lot of things that the Mac is protecting you from by popping up that authorization password every time. And I think it's just not necessary anymore. Okay. The next bit of advice is to turn off automatic login. And what that means is when you start up the computer, that it goes right to the desktop. And I think that's actually good advice for anyone who's got a computer that's either portable or in a place where lots of people, like in a dorm room, where lots of people or with you have roommates <laughs> could, could have access to it. Uh, turn off automatic login. I do that here. I have automatic login turned off. Um, if I get my computer stolen out of my home, someone could just get right into turn it on, turn it on and get into all my documents. So I would turn off automatic login so that you need the password to get into it logged in. There's another benefit too. That way people know what their password is. I've had well-meaning people set up automatic login. They can't install programs because it keeps asking for a password that they don't know. They forgot because all about they don't, it. Because they don't yeah. use it every day. Right, right. So. Uh, then they say, turn on Find My Mac, which is a good one. As long as you have Find My Mac or F Find My, which is what they call it now, somewhere else as well. Like you, you can get access that through a web browser, the Find My yeah. uh, thing, but also you can access the app on your phone and your iPad. So that's a given. Yeah, turn on Find My Mac. Yeah, because if you don't have two Apple devices, you kind of have a problem with the, with the uh, right. dual authentication and Find My. But if you've got more than one device, yes, that works. Yep. Uh, turn on the built-in firewall. That's that's a given. I don't. I to be quite honest, it's always off on by default, and yeah. so it, it, that's that is a question I have: is why don't they turn it on by default? Yeah, it's it's really weird. Uh, I to be honest, I don't know how good that firewall is. You know whether it's protecting anything. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't give a log. It doesn't tell you when it's blocked anything. It just, but what can it hurt? <laughs> so I turn it right. on. Right. And, and the router provides a firewall too. So I think that's probably less important. But as I say, when I go to look, every Mac that I see has it off by default. Yeah. So I almost hate to turn it on because like, what am I going to break? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Skype will quit working or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But but I think in general, I've never seen it, anything. It's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen anything stop working. But so I just don't know what, what it's doing, but it's sort of a black box. Turn it on. Uh, require a password. And this says immediately after sleep. Um, now, I agree that you should have it set a password. You do this in security and privacy. I should mention a lot of these things are in the system preferences, and uh, this one is particular is in security and privacy preference. Um, you sh it says to turn on the, so that as immediately after the computer goes to sleep, require it when you wake up to ask for a password. I'll be honest, I kind of set that a minute or two because there's plenty of times, like when I'm in a in the middle of a podcast, I haven't touched my keyboard in a while, and my computer goes to sleep. I'm, I don't want to have to clackety, 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 you know, you know you're in, say you're in a class, and you're constantly typing your password in or something. It just would be annoying. So I personally set that to like a minute or something like that. Just I'd even go to 15 minutes because, you know, the chances of somebody walking in right after you've, it's gone to sleep and... And getting in between you and it's pretty low. 15 minutes is probably fine, unless you're in a coffee shop. Yeah, I, I guess that would be my only concern is you have, uh, I think from our perspective, it makes complete sense to, you know, 15 minutes. But in college, there's pranks, there's, I mean, just yeah, maybe kids so. goofing off. I, I just, yep. I wonder that um, I would, I would put it more to a few minutes. Um, 
just I'll buy that. just to be just to yeah. be cautious. Just enough for time. us old folks, we can have it fifteen yeah. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I say just enough time to go uh, refill your coffee or take care of something else that might require just yeah. a minute or two. Uh, although I got to on the coffee shop thing, I'm not walking away from my laptop exactly. in the coffee shop oh, no. at all. So. Right. Um, the, the next one that they suggest, I I actually completely disagree with, which is allow apps from the app store only. Uh, no, I, I think that's the wrong choice. I think, in fact, what you should do is set it to, uh, let's see, I'm trying to find what it says exactly, App Store and identified developers. And I agree. I mean, it's the Apple isn't vetting all developers, but what it means is these are developers who've gone through the, the process of uh, going to Apple, becoming an official developer, you know, paying the 99 bucks or whatever it is to get Xcode, and getting a you know a cert a certificate, it just means that they they're trackable to some extent, but in general you're pretty safe with with the that second that app store and identified developers because if you if you just stick to the app store you're going to become kind of limited in the number of apps that you can install. Um, you couldn't Correct. install the Adobe Creative Suite, you know, or other necessary software maybe from from a class. So I'm I'm against that one. So um. Turn on I, th this is another one I I might disagree with is the turn on iCloud Drive for desktop and document folders. Uh, th what this does is it stores all of your files in your documents folder and on your desktop in iCloud. The idea is to keep them safe. I I don't do this. I don't like the idea of my my ability to work, especially when I'm doing something. That's a long, extensive process. Like, you know, my work is editing a podcast or making a podcast and having files moving in and out of the off the hard drive into the cloud while I'm trying to work. And what happens when I'm away from Wi-Fi and I'm trying to work and all these other I just. Yeah, you can still work on them. It's just that they're delayed, uh, if, especially if it's a huge file you're working on. That's where the danger is. Right, right. If I yeah, if I've got a huge file that's in the middle of syncing and I close the laptop and I walk outside and and then I open it up, I don't know. I just I don't like the idea of of the system moving my files back and forth like that. Um, although I do use Dropbox, which we'll talk about a little a little bit. Now, on a lot of people that are young students, I actually do turn that one on because the volume of their files and the size of their files is going to be pretty small. That's true, and it gives them some backup. It's not the backup you get with Backblaze or with iDrive or with a uh, uh, time machine, but it's something. Yeah. And they can see it on the phone and they can see it on their on their iPad. So for that small amount of data, I do, mm. but uh, not for somebody who's got a lot of information. Yeah. If they're starting to work with big, with bigger apps like, you know, do, uh, sound apps or creative apps or math or, math or science apps, that might be a different uh different situation. Right. Uh this one I have I am totally on board with install a password manager. Everyone yes. yep. should have a password manager. Uh one password is one I choose for me and my family. It it comes I, I pay for that, but LastPass is is available for free. Uh Dashlane does Dashlane have a free option, do you know? No. No. Uh, well, I think they they've got something like 20 items that you could put in oh, there. Almost it, nothing. You know, yeah. It's it's so it, it's it's to let you test it, yeah. really. No, I would say LastPass the free one does everything except some of the legacy things where you can um uh, uh have somebody be your designated heir, etc. It does okay. most everything else. Yeah. And um, you can have it on all your devices. Yeah, in fact, I think we've talked about about password managers mm -hmm. in the past. Um, but also, you know, teach. Don't just install it. Teach them to use it. Encourage them to use it. Make them use it. <laughs> Quiz them on whether they're using it, whether this is your kids or your parents or whoever, because it doesn't work. It it doesn't matter if you give them the software if they don't use it. They have to use it and keep a record of what their vault password is yourself in yep. your vault uh, i've had this come up more than once <laughs> for for people in, that i take care of uh where they forgot their vault password if you forget the vault password you're done pretty much um so, yeah. so keep now that. as a backup on a mac i do 
understand that saving things in the Apple keychain is a kind of a mini, mini password manager. Yeah. You can go look them up as yep. long as you remember your password to your machine and you could get them that way. And so, but it doesn't give the other things that a password manager does for keeping track of pins and security questions and all that. But it yeah. is at least a mini password manager. If they, if they just can't handle the last pass, then at least, at least use that. Yep. Uh, so th this says to set up a, or install a productivity suite like Office or iWork or G Suite. Really, if you if if it's a student, find out what their school uses or, or even offers. Like some some schools give a free license to students for Office or, yeah, or twenty five dollars for yeah. a license or something. Yeah. Yeah. The iWork stuff is free. It comes with your Mac, but the other stuff is, you know. Is more you know Office is the standard and and G Suite the the Google Doc stuff is becoming more standard uh, than it than it has in the past, but you know there there are bit discounts for students and that sort of stuff. But uh, find out for, first find out what what they need, but they could they might be able to get away with just having I work, and that's 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 a good good setup mm -hmm. setup to have. The the um, one downside that I found to that is that with the Mac publisher Microsoft publisher is not available right. on the the Mac even with the Mac Office 365. Right. And you you probably won't find a whole lot of classes that would need publisher, but if you ever needed to use publisher for for whatever reason, uh if you were in journalism or or something, then you have to go to a Windows device. Yeah, or uh, I a, didn't remember publisher being only on Windows. Yeah. That's or uh yeah, if you ever have to become Access? a parish bulletin editor you'll need publish yep. <laughs> it's pretty much every parish uh the way <laughs> i solved it for one parish was to put windows in a virtual emulator yep. that's just for that like uh there are some very light windows emulators that you can use uh but that's a very specialized situation in fact there is specialized software out there otherwise that might be windows only that you might have to consider as well and that might work in an emulator, or you might just have to have a Windows machine, which they will tell you up front. Um, in yeah. fact, we'll talk about that in a bit. And for students, I really agree that they really need to know the Microsoft suite because yep. that's the tools that business is going to expect. If you're setting one up for an individual and they're not part of an office environment where they need office, then the open office is a good alternative because it can read and write the Word documents and Excel documents and PowerPoint. And it looks really close. Yeah. And it's not as hard to make the transition it is as it is to pages and numbers. Right. It's a lot closer. So I yeah. would just say either the open office suite or or Microsoft Office. Um, and then uh, it suggests setting up a backup routine. This I think this is the number one suggestion because Students, anyone, you're going to lose data. You're going to have a situation where you're going to need a backup at some point. You always will. All of us have always done it. We've talked about backups before. They uh, they talk about the three, two, one, zero backup strategy. And this, this is sort of like my rule. You three, you must. If it doesn't exist in three places, on two different kinds of storage media, where and one of them is not where you are, say off another location or in the cloud then it doesn't exist. The file doesn't exist. That's, it's my thing. So it says three copies of your data, which could be one on your computer's hard drive itself, and then in two other places backed up. So two different kinds of storage media. So like a internal hard drive, an external hard drive, and the cloud. You know, there's different options. Um, and then, so what is this, what, are, uh, what are our suggestions for backup? The Macs come with Time Machine, which is minimum backup. But it, it's a it's really a helpful backup if they need to recover their whole machine. It really is better than just Black Blaze or Carbonite or one of the others for that. Yeah. And it's quick. Yes. yes. Because with the cloud backup, you have to upload it to their servers versus uh, Time Machine, which is a hard connection directly to your computer. But the problem is, is it's directly connected to your computer. <laughs> and if you had a fire, if you had a, right. you know, a disaster, you... You could use Time Machine, but you'd need something else. Yeah, always offsite. two. Yep. Uh, yeah. And and so basically, I would suggest for students maybe plugging in a Time Machine backup on the weekend, let it go then. When you're and at home. And then yeah. do your cloud backup where it's always connecting and backing up to the cloud. Right now, I I always have I have a a, a third solution which is I make a um, clone as well. So I use clone software, Carbon Copy Cloner on the Mac. 
Super Duper is another one where I cl- I clone my drive every night on a drive that sits next to the computer. So it's not a this is not a, a you know with the house burns down backup solution, but it's a a second kind of backup with with uh, you know a once a day backup as opposed to time machine, which could be daily or or weekly or that sort of thing. Uh, I mean hourly. I'm sorry, uh, time machine is hourly uh, you, uh, when it's standardly attached. Uh, so yeah, but well, the other thing they they suggest is don't confuse sync with backup. iCloud sync, Dropbox, th- these things are not uh, backup. They are a they are a storage place that's not on your computer or in your place. Um, but if you delete a file there, it's not it's not necessarily backed up. There's th- some of them have a sort of backup, but don't trust it as backup. You need this. Well, the th- one thing about Time Machine too, though, you do get versioning with that. Whereas if a student just clones it, it they've just got the last copy. Although Carbon Copy Cloner does a kind of versioning, uh, does depending it? on depending on the size of the drive you're connecting to your to your computer and how big the computer's internal drive is. So if you've got a 500 gig MacBook drive and a two terabyte external drive that you're cloning to, it actually has versioning in it. Uh, okay, so, I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. good. So it works pretty good like that. It's not it's not a, the best kind of, because it's a daily version, depending on how often you do your, your clone. But um, that, so that, just keep that in mind. Uh, cloud storage, You your Mac comes with five gigabytes free. That's barely enough to, to to hold anything but you know it's to back up your phone maybe <laughs> yeah it's it's fine i mean frankly I, I couldn't back up my phone to five gigabytes that's no i have a 256 anymore. gigabyte phone uh so you know if, if you have a family sharing plan uh and you could share family with not just your kids but your parents if you have a uh you know, my, my mom is on my family sharing plan i get two terabytes of data for 10 bucks a month that covers all of us. We divide it up. We have a bunch of uh, old iPads and my computer, my wife's computer, my all of our phones, all this stuff backs up in there, and all our photos and all that sort of stuff uh, are are backed up into uh, the i iCloud drive. So that's good. Uh, Dropbox is another thing I use. I use that to sync my files, my working files. Uh, I pay for that too. Um, there's also Google Drive and OneDrive. If you get the Microsoft Office 365, you get a OneDrive account, you get five gigs there. Google Drive, if you have a Google Drive account, you get 15 gigs free, but that includes your email, so just keep that in mind. So there's, well, if you, there's a if lot you of get options. Office 365, you get more than five gig. Really? Because it's, it's the free Microsoft account that gets like oh, five okay. gig, and you get a terabyte, I think, with, with uh, OneDrive. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So that's with a really Office good one. Office 365. Yeah. 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 Um, and I've I've recently had a occasion to try to use a file on my iPad, a, a, an Office file uh, was an Excel spreadsheet, in different ways. And OneDrive was the easiest way to use it on there, you know, in Excel uh, for uh, for iOS. So uh, I, I I like that method better than any of the other ones. So it's good to have several of these depending on the software you have. So that right. that's really the the list that they give us um, in this infographic, this article. Uh, but we had some other suggestions too, uh, Father Angie. You'd mentioned uh, with regard to iCloud services. You talk about iCloud Photos, the iCloud yep. Photo Library. Yeah. Um, so if if you're going to with a MacBook, it's just it makes sense to have the the devices that you can connect with it. So a MacBook is better with the the iPhone and and you know the Apple Watch and and um, all those sorts of things. And what I really, really appreciate about uh, the iCloud connectivity between those devices is principally, number one, the, the Photos app. It's built into the to the Mac. It's built into the iPhone. Um, but you have to turn on the iCloud photos in the settings in the phone or the settings um, on your Mac. But what that does is if you take a photo on your phone, then it uploads it to your iCloud library. And then it's automatically synced with your with your Mac. So you take a picture on your phone, it shows up on your Mac. And I have a ton of pictures and I take a lot yeah. of pictures. And so I just it's so I easy love, that way. Yeah. Yeah. And with with everything being digital, I just I love the iCloud photos connectivity. So that and, and I think especially with if you're heading off to college, I think photos tend to be something that that we as as young people just kind of gravitate towards anyway. So 
I would add on that and say, um, if you get if you have a Google account as well, get the Google Photos app and set that up to back up your iCloud library. So that you yep. have it in two in two places. So if something happens <laughs> in two to one, different media, <laughs> in two different media. Now, if you have the free version of the of the Google account, if you're not paying extra, you it's not h- uploading the highest resolution v- uh, version of those photos. But in a pinch, they're better than nothing, and that's that. Right. With photos are precious. So that's the a good one, one thing about that is that you do have to be careful if you've set that up that if you go into your Google Photos and you say, well, I want to get rid of it there, it gets rid of it out of your iCloud too yes. if you're doing it on your phone. Yes. It and so that is one one drawback that somebody said, well, I've got them all there. I can get rid of them. Ooh. The ones that, oh, uh, you know, and no, no, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good thing. That's and you just want to pay attention to to storage. Yes. I definitely need more than the five gigabytes that's free included into the iCloud oh, storage. Yeah. Right. Right. If you once you do ninety nine cents is cheap for the two hundred gig. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, social media apps. Uh, of course, Facebook doesn't have an app, but um, Tweetbot uh, is, is that's what I use. Does anybody use anything different? Tweetbot's what I use too. Yeah. I don't tweet. <laughs> <laughs> I just go to the website and, and tweet. Or I've got Twitter on the phone, but that's yeah. really it. And uh, there's now the Twitter app on macOS Catalina. They've they've brought that over using the uh, uh, what is the Catalyst uh, project where they can bring right. um, iPad or iOS apps over easily to Mac. So there is Twitter. I, I've i been a Tweetbot user forever, and I will continue as long as they let yeah. me. It's the better app. Uh, for Instagram, actually, if you want to have uh, Instagram on your Mac for whatever reason, you could use a program called Flume on the Mac, F-L-U-M-E. Uh, that is lets you it, it kind of – does some funny stuff that makes it think it's a uh, Nexus, uh, Google Nexus for, of all things. Oh. Um, but it lets you have your Instagram on your, on your computer for, for that. Can you yeah. upload photos t- uh, using Flume? I don't think it uploads. I think it's mainly for a viewer viewing, viewing, commenting. Um, let me just double check here. Where I get a comment. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, Cause you can also just go to Instagram on a, on a web browser too. Yeah. That's easier to me. Most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and usually with Instagram, I'm, you know, you're, you're taking a picture with your phone and then it's from there, you're going to upload it to Instagram and from the computer, oh. it's a bit more. Yeah. You can upload. You can? Uh, yeah. Okay. I see it here. Yeah. So that's, that's something I can do. So yeah. And that, that is, you can either buy that separately, but you also, you can get it through set app, which might be something you want to, we've talked about before, might be something you want to consider for say a student or, or an elderly relative or someone like that you're helping. Um, you're paying ten bucks a month, and they get to use all of the software that's there, so they don't have to worry about downloading and paying licensing. If it's in, if it's in setup, they get it. And there is tons of stuff, and I I find new stuff in there all the time that I'm using. Uh, so Netflix it, for apps. <laughs> it's the Netflix for apps. That's right. So, um, entertainment. What do you think? What what kind of stuff should we set up for entertainment on a laptop? Is sort of the basic. Uh, thing for, for whether a student or a, a relative that or, or a friend were helping set up a new Mac. What are the, what are the basics there? Well, of course, the Apple Apple uh, iTunes uh, or what the equivalent, the music app now. Yeah, yeah, music yep. app. And uh, uh, I haven't been paying for Apple Music. I've been using mostly CDs that I've already you know gathered and things I bought. But uh, so I don't know if there's, you know, Pandora, of course, is, comes to mind as something that's free and people could use that. Yeah. If they're under 25, yep. they only know streaming music. So, <laughs> right. Pandora, <laughs> Spotify. Yeah. Spotify. Yeah. That's another yep. one. Yeah. Yep. Um, so um, something like that. Yep. I use uh, for, for podcasts, there's, of course, the built in podcast app, but I actually prefer one called Downcast. Yep. Yeah, and, I like and it. I, and I and I like it. You can set up playlists of different podcasts. Um, also, Downcast. I have I'm subscribed to the Kim Commando show, and with cool. that, you have to be a paid subscriber. So I have a login information, and Downcast allows me to use my login information to access that feed. Yep. Where some of the other podcast apps, you can't. With with the podcast app built into the to the Mac, you can as well. But Downcast gives me a little bit more fun and flexibility in what I want to do with with the feeds. Right. I do the same thing with Screencast Online, which is a paid subscription podcast. So, 
And it's funny because I actually use podcasts for one set of apps, like all the SQPN stuff I do on po on the podcast for my science fiction and other things. <laughs> I use a different uh, app. I use Downcast. So I'm actually using multiples and it's easier to find this stuff at, for the thing I'm looking for. <laughs> it's it's funny that you say that because I use the podcast apps for all my Catholic specific podcasts yeah. and Downcast for my my geeky yeah. uh, <laughs> techie exactly. podcast. Yeah, that's funny. I I mix them all together in the big <laughs> stew you, of podcast. You integrate. <laughs> yes. Uh, if Overcast ever comes to the Mac, uh, that will be my podcast app of, of choice. I think, given if given how how good it is on the iOS. Um, so for gaming, Apple Arcade works on. It's brand new, so it works on all the uh, iOS devices, works on Apple TV, works on Mac. Uh, so uh, that's a good choice. Um, and then uh, one of you mentioned Steam uh, as yep. a choice. There's a lot so, of stuff on Steam that, yep. that works fine on the Mac because uh, more of them are, you know, like the traditional you pay for it type thing. But yeah. uh, it's a nice platform that I can use both on the PC and on the Mac. Yep. Yep. And I would throw out there that typically – PCs, Windows are are better for gaming. So uh, th the there's a lot gaming. there for for Mac, <laughs> yeah. but um, most people aren't getting a Mac for their gaming needs. Right, right. They'll, they'll probably have a uh, Xbox or PlayStation or something if they're yep. really yeah. Um. So the one of you mentioned uh, GIMP uh, for and Audacity for people who want to do either audio creation or uh, manipulation of uh, photos and that sort of stuff uh, yep and both right. of those are free and yeah. gimp takes a little bit of a learning curve it's sort of a um a photoshop light if you Mini. will but yeah um so it, it it's not it's not for the faint of heart but it's it's also fairly intuitive too if you just kind of get in there and play with it yep and yeah we a lot of uh, us uh on the who do the podcast here with sqbn use audacity to record uh in fact i think uh at least one of you are using Audacity right yep. now, Father Andrew. Uh, it's a, and it's a great free open source uh, software, so really good. Uh, Pat, you mentioned another one for, for right. playing media? This is for people I've noticed, that, you know, they'll get an audio or a, they'll get a video that's a different format. It's coming off a camcorder or coming off of some website that is not a standard one. And VLC can play almost any video or audio. So uh, I do, and it's free. And again, okay. it's it's one of those things that you could do use it for a lot more, but it's it's a great thing to have just around to be able to uh, take care of those videos that you can't see any other way. Okay, good. Well, there's a lot more we could talk about. Uh, we have plenty more on our list. Maybe we'll come back to it another time. But uh, but that's a good start. There's a lot there. Um, the you know the helping someone get set up for the on their first new computer, uh, you know their first new Mac in this case. It, you know, it's a lot. Uh, there's there's a, a lot of ways you can help them. A lot of tweaking to do. You know, a lot of a lot of cool software that they can get up set up with, and get them off to a good start. And uh, you know, we, we're the techies, and we're always asked for our opinion. So, one of the things I do want to mention is security. And the the one thing I do strongly recommend for a college environment is having a VPN service. Uh, because they're going to be on coffee shops, they're going to be in dorm rooms, they're going to be on networks that are there. They may have a password to get on the network, but there's a lot of people on that network. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, there's some there's I, I don't trust the free ones, but there are several different plans of different priced VPN services that I would recommend. Yeah. Don't ever trust a free VPN. Don't use them. <laughs> Just I mean, there might be some that are OK, but there are, there are enough that are bad that they're not really yeah. they're they're actually actually compromising your security on purpose uh, that you just don't want to trust them. So only go with a paid one. Yeah. ExpressVPN. I use uh, encrypt me, you know, there's, there's a couple of right, There's a bunch of them. Yeah. yeah. Good ones. Um, yep. And, and get a malware protection. Malware bytes is a good, good one. Yeah. Malware bytes. Uh, the, the, you could just run their, their, their free one periodically if you just want to check it, but the, they do the paid one is a really nice low, low uh, overhead, uh, thing to prevent stuff getting on the Mac. Yep, and I will talk in a bit about a way that you maybe can get those for uh, not much money if you get so, in addition to getting something else. But that will be in my pick of the week. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, let's move on to some headlines. There's some interesting headlines that have been recently. Uh, one of them is that uh, Twitter has announced that it will not be uh, 
running any pol- well selling political ads. You will not be able to, as a politician campaigning, be able to buy an ad on their network, uh, you know, their social media network. And they said this is because of presumably 2016, and what they said was the the um, manipulated videos, the viral spread of misleading information, et cetera, et cetera. And he just they said we just wash our hands of it. We don't want to do anything with political advertising. Uh, that's that. Um, but that's not it. That has not been universally acclaimed. What do you think of that? What do you think of Twitter's decision here? Is that is it bad to prevent? This kind of political speech. <laughs> Ooh, I, I see. I, I'm, I guess I'm more in in favor of. Yeah, there's a lot of other ways of political information that you can gather through other news sources. I don't see where it needs to be on Facebook or Twitter. I think yeah, you gotta you gotta kind of look at at what what they're geared towards, and if they're I I, I think we're all pretty frustrated with the political nonsense of of Facebook um, in the last few years. And I, 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 if you're gonna if you're gonna look for for political news and political uh, advertisements, I guess go to you. You'd want to go to a more reliable source anyway than Twitter or Facebook. I just, uh, yeah, I'm I'm more in favor of just just keep politics Lock off it. of it. And <laughs> of course, the the other you. side is that some people, mainly conservatives, say, well, mainstream media is the political advertising for the other side. You know they're biased in favor of uh, the uh, the our opponents, and so political advertising is our way of getting our side out there. Uh, that there are other mainstream media's that they could, you know, I I guess there's other magazines, other online services that they could use instead of Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, in other words, they they could come up with a conservative magazine or a conservative website or whatever and get the information out there. It doesn't need to be on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, of course, that means that they're they were only then, uh, and just taking the devil's advocate, they're only talking to people who go to these conservative outlets. You know, this is the Twitter, Facebook; these are the public spaces. Um, you know, because right now uh, the FTC says that if you run political ads, FCC, sorry, FCC uh, says if you run political ads on a broadcast station, like a TV station or radio, uh, that you have to ca- ca- care for both sides for fair play. Uh, but those rules don't necessarily apply to online communication because uh, you're paying for ads, not yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, uh, well, even the well, the ads is not true. the relevancy. It's the uh, it's just that it's not regulated. It's not regulated by the FCC, whereas the uh, airwaves are. They're owned by the public and so leased by these these stations or licensed. But um, Facebook. Deals says they deal with it differently. We fact check. We label these things whether whether they're true or not. Um, which I could see why Twitter would say I don't want to have anything to do with fact checking and labeling. That gets me into a, a difficult place where people go because uh, I've seen it myself where Facebook has labeled things as being false when that's not true. You know when when, no. when what that said is what what has been written is actually true, or. They they call it false because they have a particular viewpoint on it, and then it becomes more viewpoint as opposed to facts. So I kind of agree. I'd, I'd rather they don't do any uh, political ads at all rather than do what Facebook does. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, so then our next headline is that uh, Firefox is going to take steps, and and I I, I shout it from the rooftops, yay! To stop browser notification spam starting next year. So the pop-ups, the annoying pop-ups that, that, that we're constantly seeing, request to display pop desktop notifications. Uh, I, I don't yeah, know if the, anybody actually uses those. Oh, I I'm don't, sure well, some do. Advertisers but, do. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, you know, the thing is, is that all the browsers have a setting that you go, go in and say, don't ask to, to allow them anymore. Right. But nobody does that. The default is not that. So I think it's an, a, a very good thing that, that Firefox is saying we're going to change the default right. to be you're going to block them unless you allow them. And I think that's a much better thing. Yeah. I was surprised that Brave allows them by default. And and that was a real surprise. I expected them to be blocking it, and they don't. I would hope that they'll I go, go in and turn route. them off on all of my browsers for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's that thing where you go to a, a random website where someone's linked to it from, say, 
Facebook or Twitter <laughs> and you want to read the article and it's like, no, I, I don't care, want to get desktop notifications from your obscure little news site in Siberia. Like, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I will never come back here. Uh, so uh, yeah. bravo to Firefox. Hopefully, hopefully the rest will follow. Um, uh, this was interesting. Google has acquired Fitbit uh, to in because it wants to invest it, roll it into Wear OS, their their watches. Uh, Wear OS has fallen behind the Apple Watch. Uh, Apple Watch is, is really eating up the market. Um, and Google and Fitbit have tried to, to do it alone, and now they're going to try to uh, battle back together. What do you think of this? Does it does it make? I'm going to I'm going to guess that doesn't make either of you more interested in a Wear OS <laughs> watch or I think we're all pretty much uh, in the Apple ecosystem for that right now but what do you think I think it makes it makes Google more interesting as a competitor to the Apple Watch though Yes yeah Um I have used Fitbits before and I think I think they've been really fun to use but you're right I have an Apple Watch and so I I very much prefer that but but to have Google and Fitbit together competing against Apple, I think, is going to force both sides to come up with with more innovative technology to throw into their wearable devices, and I think that is exciting. Yeah, it's a bit of a consolidation too in this industry. Uh, so it'll be I'll be curious to see whether other players get bought up. You know, Samsung is going to buy somebody up or that sort of thing. So we'll, we'll we have to keep an eye on that. Um, so. Here's a, a little one. The uh, that uh, the first case of Apple Card fraud has been reported. So the big deal with the Apple Card is that it doesn't have the numbers printed on it. The numbers can be changed from your phone at any time. Uh, so it's supposed to be ultra secure, very as secure as any uh, uh, credit card out there. But apparently, what someone did was. Um, the guy discovered that there was a fraudulent purchase made using his Apple Card, which is very easy to find out when you when your card is used, it pops up a notification on your on your phone, and uh, it it what apparently happened is someone skimmed the numbers from the magnetic strip. It's still a magnetic strip credit card, so it's that 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 is there now. The nice thing is is how easy it is to report the fraud, to get reimbursed for it, and to just. You don't. They don't have to send you a new card in the mail. You don't have to be without your card. Uh, they. You just go into your phone, the setting, and you click the button, and it re it regenerates it a whole new number, which is amazing and awesome. Well, that's true. If you use your Apple Card at like a, what, a gas station that had a skimmer, it'd get it. Yep. Yep. That's right. So, so that's that's not that. You know that's why it's better if you have the uh, the the little I beam it type thing as yeah, opposed to sc scanning it. Yeah, use Apple Pay wherever you can, if 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 you, if you can at all. And frankly, more and more places I use it, and I use it everywhere I can, just be, to avoid all of that issue. Um, and then uh, let's see, a couple more things. Uh, just uh, Apple announced their new 16-inch MacBook Pro that had been rumored for ages. There's a new MacBook Pro coming out. Um, it's about the, it's the 16 inch. It's about the same size as the previous 15 inch, except few, fewer bezels. That's the the magic word of the design era that we're in now is we we hate bezels. So <laughs> the bezels are smaller, so it's now 16 inch. Uh, but the big deal is the new keyboard. They have returned to the old style of the scissor switch keyboard from the butterfly switch that they've had for three years and have constantly been trying to fix and constantly breaking. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because I saw that headline, and I mean, I'm I'm on a MacBook right now, but I don't actually know what keyboard I have. When did you buy and it? I've never know? had. Um, 2016. You might have one of the the scissor switch keyboards, but and and the, I mean the butterfly keyboards, which would make you very lucky because apparently they're they're very low travel compared to the old style and the new style. Uh, they they don't move very much up and down. Uh, and it was designed to be very low profile and um, have a better feel, I guess, was the, the idea. The thing is, is it, it's very fragile. And if anything gets under there, if you eat at your desk, as some of us do, you know, especially like a nice crumbly cookie or something, uh, the, if it gets under there, it can cause it to break. And there have been many, many cases of people who have taken in their laptops several times to replace the keyboard because it's broken over and over again. And people saying, oh, yes, I can't use the S key on my keyboard. It just, for one day, it just stopped working. So uh, there have been enough cases of that. Not everyone, obviously, but enough cases of it where 
they finally have responded and said, look, we're just, we've designed a whole new back to the old technology that works, but it's new technology, but it's the old technology. You know what I mean? <laughs> so back to that. It's the it's best. It's better than the, the oldest. <laughs> it's the, it's the best keyboard we've ever made. And it took great right. courage to make it. That's, yes, that's uh -huh. they will always say, uh, so th so that's the the big difference. And then uh they've also put back a an actual physical escape key. Uh the the Touch Bar uh, MacBooks have n had no escape key. It was a um in the Touch Bar, which you know yeah. sounds really cool until you're one of those people who are used to just you're reaching up by feel and hitting the escape key like programmers. Uh they did they hated it. <laughs> so they put that back. So that's a good thing. I'm um, I'm looking forward to the day when I when I need my new a new laptop someday uh that having a better system one of the things i like about the new macbooks is that they have touch id built into them where i can just instead of having to enter my password everywhere i can just touch id and be happy although then i won't remember my password pat right <laughs> right but you can also use your apple watch to unlock the the the, the macbooks etc that's what i do now with my imac although it works about 75 percent of the time uh, okay. I've, well, on my my MacBook Pro, it works every time uh, when I walk in with that Apple. Just <laughs> the watch just unlocks it, and I'm so surprised. <laughs> uh, that gets me. That annoys me even more. And under Catalina, it will now uh, uh, authenticate. It would not just unlock, but now it authenticates when it when it would normally pop up a hey, enter right. your password. That's, so that's cool. That's really nice. That's cool. Uh, and then one last headline: uh, Chrome is going to start slow shaming. If you are a slow loading website, you will get a badge in the search that says you are slow, uh, which I, I I reject this. Well, mainly because my betnet.com website until very recently was wicked slow loading. <laughs> uh, I had some friends. It's a 20 year old site. You know, but I had some friends who helped me kind of fix a bunch of stuff. It's still not the speediest site. SQPN.com is much faster. But uh, well, I don't remember it. I don't remember it being a badge on the search. I just remembered when you go to load it, if it's a slow loader at the time it's waiting to display that, it oh, gives a thing. This may be a slow loading site. Oh, you're waiting a long time because this this site loads right. slowly. Oh, well, it's not our fault. Okay. It's not our fault, Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, I suppose that's helpful. It means people might wait longer. But gosh, it feels like slow shaming. <laughs> I, I, I'm very sensitive to this, as you might as you might have guessed. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, what do you think? I mean, is that good or bad? Do you think it's overall better than than to have it than not? I think my look look at it was it's giving the person more information as to why they why this particular website is is so slow to load. They they don't blame the computer. They don't blame Chrome. They don't blame whatever. They can say, oh, this is a slow site. I think it'll just be more information. Okay. I don't see it as shaming. Oh, good, good. Uh, I will take that to heart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's move on to our uh, picks of the week. And uh, Father Andrew, I'm going to let you have the first pick this week. Okay, well, I think it probably comes as no surprise to anybody who's at all paying attention to the world of media this week is that my pick of the week is Disney Plus. <laughs> so that uh, also ties very much into the the new the the reboot of the the Secrets of Star Wars podcast because Disney Plus is where the, all the the new the the Mandalorian is exclusively streaming. But of course, Disney Plus is the Netflix of all things Disney, Marvel, Pixar, National Geographic. Um, the whole backlog of of Disney movies is all available to to stream there. Um, the other the other cool thing about it is that they've they've said that they aren't allowing R rated content on there, so it's it's oh. it's very it's family 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 Yay. friendly. So something like Deadpool, I think, is exclusive to Hulu or or something, not Disney Plus. But Spider Man is not on yep. Disney Plus, which Aww. that is that is sad. At the Spider -Man moment, it's Sony, not, yeah, um, because they're still yep, they're still tied to Sony. So it's not the complete complete catalog of movies, but it is quite 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 a lot. So it's currently, I think you can get uh, it's seven bucks a month. You can tie it in with a bundle, I think, with ESPN for like eleven or twelve dollars a month. But the other really cool thing is if you have a Verizon Unlimited plan, cell phone plan, uh, they are offering one year free of Disney Plus, and all you have to do is is go to Verizon, and they will link you to the site, and you can apply the promotion to your Disney Plus account and get a whole year free. So if you have a Verizon Unlimited 
uh, plan on your cell phone, this is totally worth it to add it to your mm. account. So cool. Disney Plus cool. is my pick. I, I got to be honest, if it weren't for The Mandalorian, I'm not sure I would have subscribed. Um, I have all the Star Wars movies on yep. disc, you know? I mean, it's just... And, uh, I mean, I like the Marvel movies. So I'm not sure how often I'm going to rewatch them. So, but... I think this is very much geared at... I was just talking to some friends of mine yesterday, um, and they have grandkids. And they were super interested in it for when the grandkids come over. They can oh, just, yeah. you know play the play the Disney movie for them. So I think for for kids, for families, it is definitely more appealing. And yeah, yeah Dom, I'm like you. I already own the the movies for Star Wars and the Marvel movies, but yeah. now I have another excuse to go back and rewatch them, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's I right. had I had also heard that a lot of the things that they were going to be releasing add to the storyline that won't be coming out any place else that they, that's going to be only released in that environment. Yeah. yeah there there are particular exclusive. edges of the story. Yeah. You'll, you'll see some of that going forward. I think even with Avengers Endgame, there was an exclusive scene released through the Disney Plus version okay. of it. Yeah. And there are future, so, there are future yeah. Marvel series and future Star Wars series that will only be Disney Plus. And that, that, that stuff probably would have drawn me in eventually. But uh, I'm there on day Maybe one. Maybe not because, this year. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, but I'm there on day one because of The Mandalorian. Just like... I'm, yeah. Uh, uh, I have Apple TV Plus. I wouldn't have bought it except that I got a new iPhone this year, and so I got Apple TV Plus with it too, which is brilliant to uh, Apple. To it's the same sort of thing. So very good. That's a good pick, uh, Pat. What's your pick this week? Well, I don't know of how many people that uh, migrate from one computer to the other, and they've still the hard drive is good in the old computer, or they need an external hard drive. I've got a, a, a situation where I've got maybe 10 or 12 hard drives that are bare bone hard drives. And uh, Sabrent is one, but uh, there are other brands of little cases that you don't even have to unscrew or anything. You open up the top, slide the drive in, and then you plug it in and you can get to it all, read, write, et cetera. So it's a great way to have multiple versions of backups like a clone and an image and a version to back up. And it's also a great way to, uh, for somebody who wants to utilize that old hard drive in their old machine, they didn't copy everything over, but they still need to get to those old pictures. Mm. It's a good way to do that. Yeah. A, a bare drive without a case is cheaper than a, a drive in a case. So if you want to have a bunch of hard drives for backups that swap in and out, yeah, this is a right. good solution. Uh, although, when you take it out of the out of this uh, enclosure, you got to protect the pins, the 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 parts that can the connector pins. Uh, right. Well, of course, now these days with SATA, they're not really pins, so they're just kind of a, a bar. So that's a little uh, bit safer. Yeah, that's than true. Than the that's IDE true. drives, they're that's much right. better than that. That's so right. I, you know, I keep several of the static-free envelopes that I can just you know slide the drive in and out and stick them on a shelf over there and then pull the next drive, and I label the outside of them so I know what's on those particular drives. But Excellent. I have had clients that said, well, I'd, I'd really like to, to use this old drive, and so that's, for, for the average person, that would be a help. For me, it's as a technician, it's invaluable. Excellent. So my pick this week is the Eero Mesh Wi-Fi system. I've recently had to upgrade my uh, Wi-Fi. I had an old Apple airport system, uh, which I loved, uh, but it, was for, it wasn't working as well as it used to. I wasn't getting coverage uh, on the other side of my house. So I had to look around because, of course, for my work, I have to have really good connectivity at home. So I settled on the Eero mesh Wi-Fi. I got, you get a base station and, a, and something called a beacon that you put somewhere else in. They just connect, and you manage it all through an iPhone. Or, or through your phone, whatever. Mine's an iPhone, but you manage it through an app on your phone. Um, I kind of wish there was a, bra a desktop or browser-based interface as well, but, you know, it, it works. It works fine. Uh, it will, You can set it to notify you every time a new device attach connects to the, to the Wi-Fi. That's really good. And then you can also get uh, additional service that you could pay for monthly or annually called Eero Secure. And that gives you some additional features, one of which is, you know, so it, you can set up uh, profiles for safe filtering uh, and ad blocking even and other stuff. Uh, it'll it'll block you from going to bad websites. Although 
I had it block me from going to so, uh, to a website that was perfectly innocuous. I'm not sure why, but I reported it to them. Said this is a your filter has is, is got this in there for some reason. It shouldn't. Um, or maybe I, there's something I should know about that website. But <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can get that through Eero, uh, something called Eero Secure, which is three bucks a month or thirty bucks a year, or you get Eero Secure Plus, which is ten bucks a month or a hundred bucks a year. And with that, you get three software packages included: one password for families, uh, Encrypt Me VPN software, and Malwarebytes, the the paid version. Uh, wow! And, and so I was already a one password customer, and and an Encrypt Me Encrypt Me VPN customer. So by doing this, I'm actually paying nothing for Euro Secure Plus comparatively. I I, I the the value is is greater than the than the one I'm paying for it. So I it's I'm essentially getting these features for free now, and a, a paid malware bytes subscription for not just me but for my wife's computers, and she gets the VPN on her phone and her her right. computer too. So actually, and when I signed up for it, just so you know, if you're if you already have one password and encrypt me, whatever you've already paid, um, they prorate it back to you, so you get a refund oh, of cool. what you've paid in and and getting set up. If you've already got an account with them, it's super easy. It was really good. Barely an inconvenience. Uh, it's a screenrant.com uh, uh, reference, but uh, super easy. Oh. Barely an inconvenience. Uh, so uh, I recommend the, that the Aero pl- uh, Plus. It was really, it's been really good for us. Uh, I did have a little bit of problem that I got a, uh, I bought it through Amazon. I got a dead uh, B, uh, base station when it arrived, but their customer service really helpful. Based in Austin, really nice and uh, really nice uh, uh, customer service guy. And they got me a new one out overnight. It was really good. So, uh, Eero, really good. All right. Cool. So that's my pick. Uh, before we finish out, I do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of technology, including Michelle M., Daniel B., Dante V., Caroline K., and Wendy T. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of technology in all the shows at StarQuest, you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. All right, so that's it from us. What did you think of our discussion? Did we miss anything important about setting up your new Mac for someone else? Uh, let us know. You can go to our show at sqpn.com slash technology or the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash Media, or you can send us an email to technology at sqpn.com. And we'll have links to our from our discussion and to the Picks of the Week on sqpn.com slash technology. Remember, please, to like each episode of Secrets of Technology on Facebook. Retweet them on Twitter at sqpn. Uh, leave us comments. All of that in social media engagement helps us goose the algorithm and get the show out to everyone who's actually asked to see it as it gets posted. Until next time, Pat Scott, thank you for joining me and sharing the Secrets of Technology. This has been fun. Thank you. And Father Andrew Kinstetter, thank you as well. Absolutely. And everybody, be sure to subscribe to The Secrets of Star Wars at sqpn.com slash Star Wars. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Technology on StarQuest. Quest.